All right. Good morning, Trinity. Uh, I'm Brian. I'm our ministerial pastoral resident, and I have the honor to preach with you all today. Uh, But before I get started, I just want to give you a bit of a warning. So this weekend, my family went camping. Uh, My brother, my parents, they're still there today. Uh, But as often, you get back from a vacation, and you're often more exhausted than you were before you left. I don't know if anyone else has that experience. But I had a great plan. I was going to wake up this morning. I was going to go downstairs, start my coffee, read through my message, drink my coffee, read through my message again, come to church and preach the best sermon Cedar Falls has ever heard. (laughs) Instead, I wake up, I go downstairs, I let the dog out, and I hear like a lapping sound. And I look down, and there's just a pool of water at the base of our fridge. And at some point during the night, our freezer decided to turn into a melter. Uh, So instead of working on my sermon this morning, I cleaned up a mess. Uh, So that being said, I think God was probably teaching me, you know what, Brian, you rely on yourself too much. Uh, Today, rely on me. Let me do the heavy lifting. So that's what I'm doing, and I trust God is going to make it more than I could have done myself. Uh, So again... Good morning, Trinity family. Uh, Or perhaps I could just say good morning, Trinity Bible Church, because we are the church. Are we not? Trinity family is the church. When you hear that word church, what do you think of? Do you think of a building, perhaps a building on the corner of Orchard and Main in Cedar Falls? Do you think of an institution If you were to just go around the world and ask a handful of random people the first thing they thought of when they heard the word church, a lot of people would probably tell you they think of the Catholic Church. It's an institution that claims to track its history back to the Apostle Peter, over 2,000 years older than many political powers. Perhaps when you hear the word church, you think of a social club, a place where people gather together and catch up with one another, perhaps share the news or local gossip? Or do you think of a body of brothers and sisters who gather to worship the almighty God? When you hear church, what do you think of? What you think of when you think of church tells a lot about how you do or you do not value the building the institution, or the people. When you wake up on a Sunday morning, are you excited and longing to go to church? Or do you wake up kind of rolling out of bed groggily, dreading the drive, dreading the sermon, dreading the music, looking forward to going home and taking a nap? We'll get back to that. But first, I want to tell you all a story. I first heard this story from a pastor named Skip Heitzig. He's the pastor who kind of gave us the inspiration for our current series, Church Who Needs It. But the story is of a mother. And one day, the mother, she wakes up and she's getting ready and she hears her son's alarm goes off. Kind of that, me, 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 then silence. Five minutes later, me, 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 silence. Five minutes later, me, 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 silence. Any parents here familiar with this cycle, (laughs) right? Alarm, snooze, alarm, snooze. Any students here willing to admit that was you this morning? Anyone else? Just me, maybe? Okay, a few of you. So this mom, she hears this, alarm, snooze, alarm, snooze, and she decides she's had enough. It's Sunday morning. So the alarm goes off, the alarm is turned off. She walks up and (laughs) hammers on her son's door. Son, measure that in mom voice. You guys know mom voice, right? Uh, Son, it's time to get up. It's time to go to church. Uh, Mom, give me three good reasons. Give me three good reasons that I have to go to church. So she's like, well, okay. Reason one, it's Sunday morning. You go to church. That's what you do on Sunday morning. Reason two, you're 43 years old. You should know better by now than to just sleep all day. Reason three, 
you're the pastor of the church. (laughs) People are expecting you to show up and preach a sermon. I hope this isn't a true story. But it strikes home. Perhaps now it strikes too close to home sometimes. But I heard it and I started thinking, why do I go to church? Why do you go to church? Why do other people go to church? So I did a bit of an informal survey. I asked people who I knew went to church, why do you go to church? I asked people who used to go to church that don't go anymore, and I said, why did you used to go to church? And I kind of got responses in two categories. The first response is people said, I go out of duty or I go out of obligation. I, I check the box. It's what good Christians do. Other people said, I go out of ritual or I go out of tradition. I grew up in a family that went to church, so my family goes to church. Other people, they said, it's social. My friends go to church. I go to see my friends, to catch up with my friends, to socialize with my friends. Then the other series were people who either they were deeper or they wanted you to think they were deeper. And they said, I go to learn about God. That's where God's word is preached, and I want to hear his word. I go to worship God alongside others. That's where God is, and I want to worship him. Others said they want to go and experience peace. The peace of God dwells at church. They go to experience fellowship. The fellowship with others happens at church. So again, you have good, you have bad. People go for various reasons. But what about you? Why are you here this morning? I know why I'm here this morning. It's because I'm that pastor who wanted to hit this news, but had to come preach today. Um, but why do you come to church? Sometimes, you know, we want to sleep in. But other times, we don't. We, we wrangle ourselves. Some of you have to wrangle kids. You have to get them in the car and get here to church. But sometimes, we'd rather be comfy on our couch, wouldn't we? And this last year, digital church became just a phenomenon. Every church went from maybe a Facebook post a week to here is our service and here is our digital plan. And sometimes, that can be a soul saver, can't it? There are times you can't make it to church. It could be a global pandemic. Maybe you're on vacation. Maybe you have the flu or some other sickness and you can't make it out. Maybe your car broke down the day before and digital church can be a soul saver. But other times, speaking for myself, I'm just too lazy. My couch is more comfortable than a pew, right? But you're here and those of you watching online, you're watching online, so clearly you care enough to hear the truth preached. And again, we value everyone who watches online and we can't wait to hopefully meet you here someday. But I started thinking about myself. When I grew up, I was that kid who was drugged to the car, screaming and kicking. Uh, Why didn't I want to go to church? Well, the, the pastor was too loud or the pastor was too quiet and I couldn't understand what he was saying. The music was too loud or the music was too quiet. The room was too hot or the room was too cold. I had plenty of excuses. But then I thought about the things that young me wanted and couldn't wait to do. Go to concerts, go to movies, go to football games. I didn't care about the noise. I didn't care about the temperature. I didn't care about the crowds. Why did I long to do those things, but I dreaded to do others? I thought about hobbies. So there was a while when I first got out of college, I had a week, five days of vacation every year. And I took all five of those days, and I saved all year to go to Indianapolis to play board games with 80,000 of my closest friends. (laughs) And I would get to interview game designers for a web series. I would get to play test games that weren't published yet. But I prioritized. I treasured that time. I didn't care what other opportunities arose. That vacation was called for. That money was called for. That energy was called for. But then I talk to other people and I think about myself at that same point in time. I didn't set aside extra time for church. I found excuses not to give to church rather than find new ways to give to the church. Why? Why this difference? And I mean, first off, spiritual warfare is a thing. There's no enemy out there trying to keep people from going to game conventions, but there is an enemy trying to keep people from church. But then I also thought perhaps it goes even deeper. It goes into my heart. 
Maybe I don't have the same longing, the same passion, the same understanding for church that God has. So my prayer is that today we're going to look at three key questions, and I'm praying that these three answers will give us that heart for the church, will give us that passion for the church. And hopefully, whatever your reason today for coming, hopefully next week your reason will be even better. So the questions we're looking at today is who built the church? Did I build the church? Did Pastor John build the church? Did Pastor Laurel Stays build the church? I mean, Peter's construction is kind of building the church. Um, But who built the church? The second question, whose church is it? Who owns the church? Whose church is the church? And then the third question is, what does all of this have to do with me? Because if it doesn't have anything to do with me, then why am I even here, all right? And last week, Peter introduced a word called ecclesia. It's a Greek word that is used for the church. It means the called out ones. That word is used 116 times in the New Testament. But the first time it is used is in Matthew 16. So that's where we're going to be today. So if you have your Bibles, feel free to turn to Matthew 16. It's about two-thirds of the way into your Bible. It's the first book of what we call the New Testament. I will also have the words on the TV here next to me. But while you're turning there, let me kind of set the scene. I love to study the geography and the background of the passages I'm reading because it gives me a better, deeper understanding. In this passage, it tells us that they're in a place called Caesarea Philippi. So I started doing some research, and I'm like, well, Caesarea Philippi, where was that? What was it like? Why were they there? And I learned that Caesarea Philippi, it is at the base of Mount Hermon. And at this point, according to old writings, waterfalls would have been gushing out of this rock face. And those waterfalls fed the river that became the Jordan River. So these are essentially the headwaters of what people in the Jordan value called the living water. And as I was reading about this, like nowadays, there's just like a faint trickle down the rock face. The Jordan River is a lot smaller as well than it used to be. But when Jesus and his disciples were there, this would have been roaring rivers and thunderous waterfalls. And Jesus was talking, and in Matthew 16, uh, 13 through 18, it tells us that Jesus came to this region, Caesarea Philippi, and he asks his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? And they said, well, some say you're John the Baptist, others say you're Elijah, still others, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. But you, he asked them, who do you say that I am? We see this transition. Peter, or Jesus is like, who do the crowds believe me to be? Then he goes, but I don't care about them anymore. Who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter, he answers and he says, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. And Jesus responded, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah. Flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father in heaven. And I say this to you, that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overpower it. So he starts with a simple question, who do people say I am? But then he transitions, he wants a deeper answer. He wants to know, who do his friends, who do his trusted inner circle, who do his disciples say that he is? And Peter, he's the bold guy in the group, right? He answers and says, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. Others may say prophets, others may say John the Baptist, but me, I believe you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. It's pretty bold, right? But then it got me thinking, as I was reading about Caesarea Philippi, I learned that they used to worship Baal at this location. He had an altar at this location. Later, his altar was torn down, and uh, people came and they worshipped the Greek god Pan at this location. And later, that was torn down, and uh, Caesar himself became to be worshipped and honored when the Romans took over, hence Caesarea, it comes from Caesar. But then even more recently in Jesus' time, Herod said, my son Philip the Tetrarch deserves honor. So they named the place Caesarea Philippi, after Philip the Tetrarch. Ball, Pan, Caesar, Philip. This is a shrine of false gods being replaced by other false gods. Ball, huh, he's dead. We don't worship him anymore. Pan, huh, he's dead. We don't worship him anymore. Caesar, well, Caesar died. We don't worship him anymore. Well, let's try Philip. This is a shrine to dead gods. And on this shrine, Peter says, you are the Messiah 
the son of the living God. That'll preach, right? Like, Peter deserves an amen. Come on. Um, And I mean, other times, Peter cuts a dude's ear off and gets outrun to the tomb by John and denies Jesus. We give him a hard time. But right here, Peter crushes it. Peter says what needed to be said. And Jesus said, blessed are you, Peter, son of Jonah. Flesh and blood did not reveal these things, but my Father in heaven, like, how cool would it be to be Peter at that moment? How much do you want to hear? I would be so happy if one day Jesus said, blessed are you, Brian, son of Ron. Flesh and blood did not reveal these things. Like, yes, please. Like, my friends would never hear the end of it. You know, you're at a dinner party. Hey, guys, remember that one time when Jesus said, blessed am I? Um, But Peter nails it. So who built the church? Jesus tells Peter, you are Peter. And on this rock, I will build my church. And the gates of Hades will not overpower it. Now, some theologians, they would make sure that I mentioned that Peter, Petros, means rock. Because Petra means rock. And they'd make me spend the rest of my sermon explaining and elaborating on that. And so I started that research, and I realized that is true. Petros is the masculine form of Petra. But Jesus said, you are Peter, Petros. And on this rock, Petra, I will build my church. He did not say, you are Peter, Petros. And on this rock, Petros, I will build my church. He used the feminine form for rock. So either, as I thought about this, I came up with two theories. Theory one, Jesus is having some fun at Peter's expense and he's calling Peter a girl. (laughs) I'm not above thinking Jesus has some witty sarcasm from time to time, he definitely does. But I think there's something more. I think Jesus is driving a point home. And so as Jesus says, you are Peter Petros, and on this rock, Petra, I will build my church. Uh, So I dug deeper into that, and I learned that there's different Greeks. There's Attic Greek and Koine Greek. And I'm going to save you all a Greek lesson, because let's be honest, no one wants that right now. Um, But the Catholics are very intentional that Peter is that rock. Because according to their history, their popes have a direct line of secession to Peter. And so it is key that Peter is that rock. I think they missed, actually. So in Acts 15, the early church has to make a decision. And so the leader of the church, James, not, yeah, James, not Peter, makes a decision. So clearly Peter was not what they would have called the Pope. James was. So there goes that theory. So the debates are missing a key. Jesus is the one talking. And Jesus says, on this rock, I will build my church. Not you will build my church. Not they will build my church. Not y'all will build my church. I will build my church. Jesus is the builder. But Jesus is also the Petra. Jesus is the rock. And Peter, Petros, Petros knew this. In 1 Corinthians 3, he says, no one can lay a foundation other than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Jesus is the foundation that the church needs to be built upon. So who builds the church? Not Peter, not James, not us, not Peter's construction. Jesus builds the church. So again, who builds it? It's not the most strategic thinkers. It's not the most charismatic preachers. It's not the most energizer people people. It is Jesus. But there are churches whose foundation are those charismatic preachers, whose foundation are those energizer people, people. And what happens when those people inevitably grow and retire and die? Those churches collapse because they had a faulty foundation. Jesus is the only foundation that can sustain the church. And he built the church on that foundation. So as pastors, we need to be humble. As Trinity grows, as we build this expansion, 
we can't take credit. We can't say our church is growing because Peter, Steve, John, or myself preach the best sermons in town. We can't say we're growing because Bruce at first service or Jeremy's team here at second service have the best worship in town. We can't say we're growing because we have the best shepherding board and the best trustees board in town. Now, those things are all true, right? Like, um, I might be a little biased there. But when we grow, we are only growing because Jesus builds the church. And Jesus has ordained that growth. And so if, when, and how we grow as leaders, we need to be humble and we need to know that it is Jesus who builds the church. And that brings us to the second question then, like who owns the church? Whose name is on the deed? Uh, Whose church is this? And Jesus said, I've said it like 10 times at this point, hopefully you guys have caught this, I will build my church. Jesus is building Jesus' church. On this rock, I will build my church. He's not building Peter's church. He's not building James' church. He's not building my personal church. He's building his church. Jesus is building Jesus' church. So what does it mean that the church is Jesus? What does it mean that the church belongs to him? I thought about it for a few weeks. I wrestled with it. We had a discussion with our preaching team about this question, and I decided I need two metaphors. I cannot explain this properly with one metaphor. So my first metaphor is football, but don't worry. You do not need to understand a thing about football. So growing up, I was a Chiefs fan. I cheered for Marcus Allen. For some reason, he was my favorite, no idea why. And for most of those 30 years, I would proudly tell anyone I was a Chiefs fan despite the fact that never in those 30 years did I know what it looked or felt like to cheer for a good team. (laughs) Now, that changed recently, and I'm ecstatic about that. But I would gladly say the Chiefs are my team. Now, does that mean, like, I get to go to the board meetings and, like, sit here and draft day, I could call up a coach and be like, hey, I don't know if you saw the you and I game last weekend, but there's this guy you got to call up. Like, no, I have no ownership over the Chiefs, do I? So when I say the Chiefs are my team, that's not the same as saying this is my Bible. Like I own this Bible, this is my Bible. I do not own the Chiefs. And yet I say the Chiefs are my team. That means I support that team. I cheer on that team's success. I mourn that team's defeat. I feel the pain and the frustration and the joy that the players face. I set aside time, I set aside energy, I set aside money to support my team. So when I think of Trinity as my church, as you think of Trinity as your church, do you enjoy Trinity's success? Do you mourn when Trinity struggles? Do you set aside time, energy, and resources to support your church? Or do you try to grasp at some element of ownership, some element of control, because we think it's mine, I should have control over it? Which brings me to my second metaphor, the idea of renting versus owning. Up until 2019, I had never owned a house. I was always a renter. And there was quite a while, every Wednesday, I would host a game day for a group of friends. And I would send a message, and I'd be like, hey, guys, game day at High Property Management's place, Wednesday, 6 to 9. Pretty sure that's actually not what it said. I'm pretty sure it said game day at my place, right? You don't say game day at High Property Management's apartment. It's my apartment. But it's not my apartment. I don't own the apartment. But I have this sense of belonging. It belongs to me despite that lack of ownership, that same way that Trinity belongs to me. I ought to care for it. I ought to respect it. I ought to love it. But it's ultimately not mine. It's ultimately God's. And you can talk to any landlord, and they'll tell you that renters do not properly care for their renting. We can't do that with the church. We have to respect it as if we own it with full knowledge that we don't. There's a pastor named James Kennedy And he once said an amazing thought about the church. He said that most people 
think of the church as a drama. It's a one-act play. The minister is the chief actor, God is the prompter, and the congregation is the critic. And by all means and assumptions, that looks true. I am up here preaching. I'm doing my one-act play for you all that God prompted me through study and reading and preparation to present to you, to hear, critique, and apply. But then he goes on. He says, what is actually the case, the congregation is the chief actor. The minister is the prompter. And God is the critic. So yes, God hopefully inspired this sermon, if I did my part correctly, I listened to him. But this prompt is going to you, royal you. I am involved in this you. This prompt is coming to you, the chief actors. And God is the one watching. God is the one seeing if we are playing our part well. God is the one who, as we arrive, will say, well done, my good and faithful servant. And this is not a one-act play. This is not a drama that goes from eight to noon Sundays. It goes from birth to death. Daily, we are playing our role. Daily, we are serving, worshiping, and glorifying God. So if Jesus built the church and the church is his, well, then what does that say about us? What what is our role? What does this have to do with me? Nothing. All right, so the worship team can come up. No, that is not the end, right? Uh, If that was true, then none of us would be here. But at the same time, that's true. The church doesn't exist for my entertainment. It exists to help draw me closer to God. And Peter understood this. Peter, Petros, he understood that the church is Jesus. I will build my church. But Peter also understood that we had a role to play. He explains in the letter to Christians throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, Bithynia. It's a letter that we have come to call 1 Peter. In chapter 2, verse 9, he says, You are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his, for Jesus, for God's own possession, so that you may proclaim the praise of the one who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. So what does it have to do with you? It means you are a royal priesthood. You're a holy nation for God's possession. I was talking to a gentleman after first service, and he mentioned that Jesus also is not above some clever wordplay. And he says, you are Peter, Petros, and on this rock, Petra, I will build my church. Petra is the feminine form of rock, and the church is the bride of Christ. Who knows if that's what Peter was going for, or if that's what Jesus is going for, but regardless, that's some pretty cool wordplay, right? Like, way to go, Jesus, that's awesome. Meanwhile, in English, we don't even have like masculine and feminine half the time. Um, But we are that royal priesthood, that holy nation. We will be the bride of Christ. So what are you going to do with that? We are the messengers. You are a royal priesthood for Christ's possession so that you may proclaim the good news of Christ, so that you may proclaim the promise of redemption. But Jesus does more than just declare that. Jesus adds, the gates of Hades will not overpower it. I like old weapons. I like medieval history. I like medieval armor. Uh, So like everyone, I'm assuming I'm not the only one who's done this, but while I was in college, I was like, I need to build a suit of chain mail. Uh, You've all done this as well, I'm assuming, right? Uh, So I buy wire and I make my own chains and then I start weaving my own chain mail. And over the course of the summer, I finished most of the haberk, that is the chain mail suit. And again, I'd love to see your guys' chain mail that you made. Um, But then I also am like, you know what? I also need a sword. So again, like all of you, I went out and I got a leaf spring from a semi-truck and I got an oxyacetylene torch 
and I got a hammer, and I made a sword, because that's what we all do, right? Um, but never in my study of medieval weapons and armor and history did I read of the historian who says, and then the offensive army grabbed the gates that they had brought with them and attacked the defending army. Because gates aren't an offensive weapon, are they? Gates are on the defense. Gates are what we siege. Gates signify the defender. On this rock, I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not overpower it. I see two things. I see first a promise, a promise that we will win. The gates of Hades, the gates of hell will not overpower the church. But I also see that we need to be on the offensive. We need to be sieging the gates. So what does this have to do with you? What does this have to do with me? I see two questions. Remember the, the poor reasons for coming to church out of duty, out of obligation, out of ritual, out of tradition, because our friends are there? Those are reasons that many of us, some of us here today, perhaps myself included, are here. But what about next week? Why will you be here next week? Are you here to check a box? Or are you going to be coming back because this is God's church? God built this church because we are a royal priesthood, a holy nation for God's possession so that we can be equipped to take that message to those around us. And this is where we get equipped. So why will you be here next week? Will you be here for a poor reason or because this is God's church, the church that God built for us for his glory. And as a member of that royal nation, as a member of that holy priesthood, who are you going to take this message to this week? Are you going to hoard this good news, this truth to yourself? Or are you going to look at the world around you and say, my neighbors, my coworkers, my family need this truth? So church, who needs it? I do. You do. The world does. So what are you going to do about it? Apathy is not an option. We're going to transition to a time of communion. How is that for a segue? Um, so you have at your seats these all-in-one communion cups. Feel free to grab those. Uh, we here at Trinity Bible Church, uh, we honor the idea of communion. We agree with the Apostle Paul. And if you need a gluten-free communion wafer, let us know, throw your hand up, and we will bring you a gluten-free communion wafer. But we agree with Paul when he looks at this idea of communion as an act of remembrance. It's something that we do to remember Christ crucified, to honor that sacrifice, to remember the promise that through and because of his death, we can have a relationship with him. In 1 Corinthians, Paul was writing to the church and he's explaining this practice of communion. And he says that on the night when Jesus was betrayed, the Lord took bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So like that, take the bread, the wafer. And remember, this is symbolic of the body of Christ, pierced and died for you as you eat of this bread. He then writes that in the same way, Jesus took the cup. And after supper, he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So again, this cup is representative of the blood of Christ, a covenant, a promise that Christ made for our benefit. And as you take this drink, you are proclaiming of Christ's death and longing for his returning. So drink this with me.
I'll invite the worship team to come up as I wrap us in prayer. God, thank you so much for this church. Locally, Lord, globally, contextually, physically, spiritually. God, you built this church knowing full well what it would look like throughout history, God. You built the church starting with your crucifixion, ending with your return. God, I thank you that we were able to come, we were able to praise, we were able to worship and learn from you. I pray, God, that you just keep our hearts prepared this week. Help us long to return next week. Help us, Lord, remember your death, long for your returning, and proclaim the good news of your saving grace day to day. Help us, God, next week as we return. Help us come for the good reasons to closer to you, Lord, to connect with one another, to glorify your name. And help us put our preferences on that altar. Help us come before you and you alone. God, all these things for your name's sake, for your kingdom, and 